Today. Okay, and now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Michael Tepper from Oxford University, who will talk about lattice gauge theory and confinement. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to do so. Um, this is a topic, well, the organizer asked me to give an introduction to lattice gauge theory, uh, given that presumably a large fraction of you uh, uh, don't often come, uh, aren't too familiar with lattice gauge theory. So um, it's not going to be an overview, it's going to be an introduction. It's really not really possible to give an overview because the lattice, uh, you know, lattice simulations, lattice field theory is a technique and it addresses nowadays enormous number of problems, uh, interesting physics problems. Uh, and so uh, it's just not, it uh, will be too many to cover in an overview. So instead, I will focus on giving an introduction to the sort of basics and focus on gauge theories, that is gauge theories uh, without fermions, because uh, fermions will be dealt with by uh, another speaker, Fiala Shanahan, uh, later, um, shortly, uh, starting tomorrow, I think, in a set of lectures. So you'll learn from her really what's going on with fermions on the lattice. With me, it'll be mainly to do with gauge fields on a lattice. And uh, the sort of things I'll be talking about initially are just a general introduction, uh, and I'll give some examples. So I won't be able to go into all the details, but I'll try to go into enough details that this kind of uh, introduction isn't too banal. You can actually see some of the problems and some of the things that one needs to do. Um, and uh, so the examples I'll focus on will be to do with global spectra in SUN gauge theories, in particular the n going to infinity limit, uh, and uh, the confining properties of SUN gauge theories, deconfinement, topology on the lattice, which is sort of interesting because, of course, topology has to do with continuous deformations, and on a lattice, you don't, in a sense, you don't have that because the space-time points are discrete. Um, so it's interesting to see how topology can be actually located, the topology of the gauge fields can be located, and how you can uh, change topology on the lattice. Uh, then I'll say something briefly about two plus one dimensional SUN gauge theories. There's a lot of interesting things you could say about it. I'll first, in that small section, say something about why it's sufficiently similar to three plus one dimensional gauge theories that uh, it's worth pursuing when one is primarily interested in, in uh, three plus one dimensions. And then the, in the final lecture, I hope to say something about what we have learned about confinement on the lattice, some hints and some results. Okay, um, so a brief overview, having said I'm not giving an overview, somehow I wrote it there, uh, about the lattice. So the starting point, if you like, is, not to, is nothing to do with the lattice at all, it's to do with going from Minkowski space-time to Euclidean space-time, which you're very familiar with, uh, the path integral from one to the other uh, there. Uh, the reason for doing that from the point of view of someone who does simulations of theories is that here, what you have is a phase factor and what's multiplying it is proportional to the space-time volume. So this is a phase factor that is oscillating incredibly rapidly uh, as you change the gauge, gauge fields. So trying to do a numerical evaluation of this is hopeless with any kind of a computing strategy that relies on today's type of computers. Um, and uh, so instead, if you do a Euclidean, uh, go to Euclidean space time, you have something nice, which has no phase factor, as long as you, of course, you stick to this action here. Uh, I say that because one might be interested in various other actions, even with a pure gauge case, you might add a theta term that's got an I in front of it, even in Euclidean space-time, it's a phase factor, and that uh, encounters the same kind of problems that you would have to some extent here, and uh, people struggle with uh, thinking of techniques to deal with it. But I will stick to this uh, with theta equals zero, the theta parameter being zero, this standard action here. Okay, what can we do if we stick to this kind of action? Um, at the moment, we're still in the continuum. The sort of thing we can calculate is the spectrum of um, the energy spectrum, the mass spectrum. So 
you take some correlation function, uh, here's some operator phi, and you look at how its value at zero is correlated with this value of time t. You do a, you pull out the uh, time with a Euclidean time translation, which is e to the minus ht. You put in complete sets of energy eigenstates here and here, the energy eigenstates, so the uh, h is diagonal in those states, and so the sum here is exactly the same as the sum here, and you just get a modulus squared as a coefficient, and the energy of the ith state. So the energy of the ith state here, and a factor like that in front. So you see from that, and uh, so you see from that factor that um, what you um, uh, that the uh, states that contribute here, the states for which this factor is non-zero, are those where the quantum numbers of i are the same as the quantum numbers of the operator phi. So if you want to get the spectrum of some of some uh, uh, the energy spectrum of some states, you choose an operator which has the same quantum numbers, and then you'll just get quantum numbers. So this is all fairly uh, standard. And for those of you who have ever done any kind of calculations of this kind, it's, uh, I'm, it's sort of slightly boring, I imagine, but we'll move on. So anyway, so the other factor about here, so it's a sum of exponentials. And uh, if you want the, just the ground state, you make time large and the fast falling exponentials disappear first and you're left with the ground state. So it's uh, in principle, no problem calculating the ground state from such a correlation function. You can also calculate the excited states, they're here, but that's slightly harder. It's much harder, in fact, if you have a calculation with uncertainties in it. So, um, so much for Euclidean correlators, Euclidean space-time. Let's move on to um, seeing what we can do if we want to do computer simulations. We need to have a finite number of degrees of freedom. So the first thing we can't have is a space-time continuum, too many points. So we go on to a lattice. In addition, we can't have an infinite volume, so we have a finite volume. So normally what one does, it goes from, you uh, normally go from, you, <coughs> sorry, let's, uh, I thought that was going to go backwards. Yeah. Okay. So uh, normally, what uh, you, you do, oops. Yeah. Fat finger problem. Okay. Normally, what you do is you go from Euclidean r to the four to a hypercubic lattice on a four torus. That is to say. You're on a, hyper on, a, on a cubic lattice with periodic boundary conditions, making the volume finite and making a, a giving you a self a finite lattice spacing means that you have a finite number of degrees of freedom to deal with, which you can in principle deal eventually with numerically. Okay, what are the degrees of freedom here? The degrees of freedom, well, let's look at the continuum. The degree of freedom we're interested in in, in the continuum is the gauge potential. And what is the role of the gauge potential? Well, the gauge potential enables you to compare color, the, the color of neighboring points. By neighboring, I mean infinitesimally neighboring, not a finite distance. If you want to have a finite distance between two points and compare their color, you have to use a path-ordered exponential of the gauge potential. Uh, that, when you do a gauge transformation, acquires the gauge transformation at one, one side and the conjugate gauge transformation corresponding to this point at the other end. Now, this the gauge potential is, of course, an element of the uh, Lie algebra, and this is an element of the group. So the natural thing to do on a lattice, where you do have points which are spaced by a finite distance from each other, is to use degrees of freedom, which are elements of the group, just like this. In fact, you can sort of think of the cubic lattice as being embedded in a continuous field in, in order to gain intuition about what you're doing, but of course, it's not embedded in a continuous field in reality, it's just a separate lattice. Um, so, uh, and I will label the points by uh, either X, which is the con normal continuous uh, value label, but, these, but actually what the, the values it takes are the lattice spacing times an integer. Okay, so what we have in our theory is we have a hypercubic lattice and we have a, a SUN matrices, uh, UL, which I label on each link L, which is 
the way I will label this, I will have other labels for it later on, which are more convenient whenever they're more convenient. So it's, I describe this as being hypercubic lattice with periodic boundary conditions. Usually that's the case. Sometimes you may want other boundary conditions for specific purposes and you're free to do so. The advantage of periodic boundary conditions is that there is in some sense no boundary. So when you're doing correlation functions, it doesn't matter where you place your operators on this torus, they're the same separation apart. Whereas if I had some specific boundaries with uh, whatever Dirichlet, something else, then, then I would have to be away from those boundary boundaries some distance in order to calculate my correlation functions and things get more complicated. On the other hand, having different boundary conditions may be useful for other purposes. So that's an open possibility. But in all the calculations I'll show, the boundary conditions will be like this, periodic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In the period lattice, you were talking about taking the ego which is going to infinitely. For that, what you would do here is put more points in the direction. Well, oh, you, uh, that's, that's right. You can either, well, you have a, you have a choice. You either uh, initially at t equals zero, if you want to go to zero temperature. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you want to go to t equals infinity, sh shrink it, well, uh, the time direction. Uh, here, we are, at the moment, I'm sort of assuming that if we're talking about t equals zero, because these systems all have a mass gap and so on, uh, as long as you make the volume and the time direction sufficiently large, any corrections will be exponentially small in the ma mass gap. And uh, to the accuracy that we'll be doing our calculations, uh, that's, that will be the case. And I will also discuss deconfinement where we precisely change the temperature and see what happens by uh, decreasing the time direction. Um, <clears throat> when you can decrease the time direction, of course, all these particles can propagate around and which essentially creates this gas that you have at a finite temperature. Okay, so um, so the gauge, so we're on the lattice now, and we want it to be like uh, to eventually get the continuum theory. So um, we've picked our variables, which are SUN matrices on the links of the lattice, and we define uh, a gauge transformation in the same way as you would have with as a, a path ordered exponential going from one side to the other, which is to say we define the, it like this, where G's are themselves uh, SUN matrices. And um, so that's a gauge transformation on the link variable. And what we want, of course, in order for that to be a symmetry, we want the uh, action to be invariant under that transformation. So uh, we recall that if we are, if we are in the continuum, if you have a closed curve and you take the path ordered exponential around that closed curve, uh, then uh, the trace is gauge invariant. And the same is true here when you replace the, when you take the, when you take some closed curve on the lattice and you look uh, with a boundary, the boundary of a closed, well, this is a bad notation. Some, uh, okay, you take some closed curve on the lattice and you take all the links, the product of the links around that curve uh, back to the origin uh, that you started from. Um, and this is always, I, I should have said path ordered here, but you'll understand that my products are always path ordered. So um, suppose I do a gauge transformation, then in this product of, of uh, along the curve, as you go along the curve, every, uh, every, um, every link matrix will acquire a gauge transformation at one end and a conjugate one at the other end. But the subsequent link matrix will have the same, will have starting from the same point as the previous one finishes, will have uh, a G, which will be precisely this, this thing here. Uh, which will be precisely uh, the gauge transformation the, uh, uh, at that same point, and the two will cancel each other out because they're unitary. So you end up, just as in the case of uh, the path of the exponential around the, around the curve, you end, up with, um, you end up with just two gauge transformations, the one at the beginning of this product and the one at the end. They're both at the same point because you've come to back to the same point as a closed curve. And because it's a trace, you can do a cycle, you can move this cyclically to here and it cancels this one out and you're back to what you started with. So it's gauge invariant. So I can take any closed curve on my lattice, take the 
path ordered product of the link matrices along it, take the trace and that's gauge invariant. And that makes it a possible action, part of the action of this theory. Well, for the action, we want something that is as local as non-trivial, but reasonably local. So the first choice you might make, and the one I will make, is to use what's called the plaquette, which is the elementary square on the lattice. So the elementary square is just, uh, of course, just, um, I don't know if everyone could see this. You go around the lattice like that with a U here, a U here, conjugate U here, conjugate U here because you're going backwards. And uh, that is to say, I've actually written it explicitly here. If you take, if you want a plaquette which is in the mu nu plane, where mu and nu are the directions, starting from the site N, it first, you first have the matrix going in the mu direction, then you have the um, matrix going in the new direction. By mo you move up one lattice spacing in the new direction here. And you have that one. And then you complete the square. And that, if you take the trace, will be a gauge invariant of that. And if you take the sum of all plaquettes, then uh, if you take the real part of the trace, that projects onto thing, uh, charge conjugation positive because under charge conjugation, the U's go to their complex conjugates. And so uh, the plaquette would go to his complex conjugate. And by taking the real part of the trace, you, uh, you uh, just get the real part. Uh, you, you, you don't get the charge conjugation uh, negative piece. So that's what you want in the action for the vacuum to be charge conjugation positive. And uh, you take a sum over all plaquettes that means it's got translation invariance because you've summed up over all plaquettes. It's got rotation invariance because all rotations of plaquettes are there and parity invariance as well. So, so uh, in fact, it has all the symmetries you would want for the action in addition to gauge invariance. So that is the action I would use, a very simple one. It's got, this one is not really necessary, but it's convenient because with this normalization, the maximum value of the real part of the trace of a SUN matrix is a, it's an n by n matri unitary matrix. So its maximum value is n. You divide by n, you get one. So one minus one is zero. So uh, it's bounded, it's a nice bounded value it is here. It goes um, between one and two. So, um, right. Now, okay, so we're, we have the lattice we have our lattice theory defined. We have the variables, we have the lattice. Um, and uh, you notice, of course, that uh, we can then put, we can write it like this. This is the path integral. And there's just one parameter there, which is this thing beta, which we haven't fixed, which we won't fix, which is a, it's a parameter. Apart from that, there are no parameters, explicit parameters here. There is, of course, the volume, but I'm assuming the volume is large enough that it plays no role at this, at this moment. Sometimes the volume does play a role and that's uh, deliberate when one does those, when one, uh, and uh, we, we'll come to that later when it does play a role. So uh, we have this lattice action, but what we would really like to, uh, um, uh, what we would really like is the continuum theory. So the question is, uh, what can we do to this? How do we vary beta? this parameter here, which is the only thing we can vary in order to go to this continuum limit. We'll never get to precisely the continuum limit because of course that's something we can't simulate. So we will go, we will take a number of steps making the lattice spacing smaller, which is, uh, and making it go towards zero. And then we will extrapolate to the continuum limit, the results we've had at those values of A at which we've done calculations. So the continuum limit is really looking for where the, some beta critical where the lattice spacing goes to zero. Now, uh, if the only, the only scale I've got in this theory, having said the volume is irrelevant, is the lattice spacing itself. So what do I mean by the lattice spacing going to zero? Well, I mean in physical units. And what do I mean by physical units? Well, the physical units are actually the physical quantities which are generated by this lattice theory. So when I get round to calculating masses in this lattice theory, I will find a mass gap. And that mass gap provides a scale, at least its inverse provides uh, a length scale for me to measure the lattice spacing in. 
And so in, the, in terms of those physical units, I want the lattice spacing to go to zero. So, um, well, if we look at this relationship here, what we want to achieve, we can see that since this doesn't depend on the coupling, this doesn't depend on the coupling, beta must have a variation like one over G squared. In fact, we'll see uh, when one does this more carefully, one sees that the coefficient is 2n. The n more or less has to be there because here we've got rid of the factor n dependence by this one over n rescaling of the plaquette, while here we haven't. So there's an extra factor of n which will come from here. So really in the continuum limit, beta is n times something over g squared. And when you do things carefully, you see it's 2n over g squared. Now, <clears throat> the g squared is a coupling which is defined uh, on the scale of this uh, path interval. And everything here, all the degrees of freedom are on the scale of the lattice spacing. So you can think of the G squared as being a running coupling on the scale of the lattice spacing. Now, this of course, there are many ways you can define running couplings, enormous number of ways, and you have a great freedom there. And uh, this particular, and you call them different schemes. And this scheme in which you've just defined this running coupling, you can call the, um, it's, if you like, it's a lattice Wilson action scheme. It's what you get when you define it this way, basically. So that's a particular scheme. But one thing you do know, although you may not know how this varies in general with the scale A, what you do know is that once A becomes small because of asymptotic freedom and the fact that the first two coefficients of the beta function are universal, you know that uh, as the lattice spacing goes to zero, G squared goes to zero. So therefore beta goes to infinity. So you know where to look for your uh, continuum limit. You just keep increasing beta, do calculations at larger and larger beta, and uh, eventually extrapolate your results to beta equals infinity. And that's because of asymptotic freedom, of what we know in advance. If you take, if you just consider smooth fields, then you can see how this works in, in a bit more detail. I won't go through all the details. So you start off with your, your group elements on the lattice and you write them in terms of the Lie algebra, which is, so this is quite general, exponential of I AL, where I've pulled out a factor of I, that's the way I've defined my Lie algebra elements. Then um, these things, of course, this is dimensionless. So this is dimensionless, but ultimately I want gauge potentials and those have dimensions of mass here in four dimensions. So I will uh, pull out from little curly A, just formally, I will just pull out a lattice spacing and define a new variable, just normal A, L, which has dimensions of mass. So that's just the redefinition and definition of A, L. Then if the field is smooth, I can expand this in powers of lattice spacing. Lattice spacing is small as I, as I approach the continuum limit. And if the fields are smooth on the scale of lattice spacing, I can expand this and uh, in this form. And uh, now if you do this around the plaquette, what you will get is you will get the A mu from one side of the plaquette, here, for example, and then you'll get the A mu from the, the position up here. So what, but it will be a minus A mu because of the reversal of the direction. So you get the difference of two A mu's. It's a finite difference, uh, a finite difference. And as the lattice spacing goes to zero, that finite difference will become a derivative. And the derivative, will become, um, has to by symmetry, by the gauge invariance, will have to give you the F mu squared times A to the fourth. And indeed you can go through the details, keeping everything and, and you see that's what happens. So, um, so for smooth field, fields, it's, it's very simple to do this. Of course, the real fields that you have fluctuate on the scale of the lattice spacing. So you have to be more careful and uh, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's a more sophisticated uh, uh, approach there. Uh, which, um, which for its success is effectively you do an effective field, uh, it's an effective field theory uh, approach for the plaquette action. And uh, the fact that it works is due to uh, uh, ultimately to asymptotic freedom. The point is that if you, when you do this kind of expansion, you've got A to the fourth times the trace F mu F mu, but you also have higher order terms. The first higher order term is multiplied by an operator which involves can't remember the exact form, but involves uh, F mu nu's and it involves covariant derivatives with the appropriate dimension, dimension, uh, dimension six. Uh, now you would say, well, this is A to the sixth and this is A to the fourth, that's fine. 
but actually uh, that uh, really relies on asymptotic freedom because if I had a, if my continuum limit was not at zero coupling, but at some non-zero coupling, then the operators would, could would in general have anomalous dimensions. And, there, and, the, and it may be that this operator is no longer marginal, but uh, will become important. So it's because of asymptotic freedom that we're confident uh, that we can do this kind of expansion here for these non-abelian gauge theories. It will be harder work and um, it will be different if we were looking at other theories, but we can still look at them. It's not that they're uh, uh, impossible to analyze. It's just that it will be uh, a different game. So uh, those of you who've uh, occasionally heard about the lattice uh, will have heard possibly people talking of improved lattice actions. And uh, here's a simple example, just so you you see at least one route that one can follow what is involved. Uh, we just said that, you know, this, this operator here uh, on the lattice uh, gives you a to the fourth trace f u nu squared plus order a to the sixth. Now, if you want a faster approach to the continuum limit, you might think that could be achieved by getting rid of this first correction. And that you could do by um, adding uh, new loops, not just the plaquette, but add rectangles to the action and give them coefficients so that the leading term is still this, but so that there is a cancellation of the next term. That can be done. Of course, by itself, the easy, easy part is to do it at tree level, neglecting quantum corrections, and that's quite inadequate. So one can do better than that by uh, doing perturbative collect corrections. So those coefficients of the rectangle that the rectangles are multiplied by and the plaquette is multiplied by are series in the coupling. So that's the sort of thing you can do to improve the action. It's actually for the pure gauge theory calculations I'm talking about, it's not really necessary. These kind of calculations would be sl slower if you do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, and the improvement you get is not necessary because the pure gauge calculations are very fast. You can do them on your desktop computer. You can do some of them on your desktop computer after all. So, um, However, they are very important when you come to fermionic calculations, which are very uh, time intensive on computers. Okay, so um, another thing that's improved sometimes is the lattice coupling. So I defined uh, lattice coupling, I said beta is equal to 2n over a running coupling on the scale of the lattice spacing. That's the definition of a running coupling. However, this running coupling is actually, this scheme, if you like, is a rather poor scheme. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, quite a long time ago, um, the lambda parameters for um, in perturbation theory for this scheme and for the MS bar scheme, the ratio of those lambda parameters was calculated. That was back in by uh, Dashen and Gross. <laughs> and so uh, way back, uh, like, like actually a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here was quite a way back. This was in the uh, early 80s. So, um, and if you look at this, it's, quite, it's a large number. Now, what is that telling you? Well, it's telling you, since, since if you did the whole calculation to all orders, well, forget about the fact these are asymptotic series, and never mind about sophistications of that kind. But anyway, if you calculate all orders, you should get the same result, whichever scheme you get, whichever scheme you use. And if they have very different lambda parameters, that in general means that they're one of them, that they have very different high order corrections. Now, the usual belief is, our friends in who do perturbation theory tell us the MS bar scheme is a good scheme, more or less. So I'll believe that. I, I hope that's true. And in that case, this scheme is a bad scheme. It's got large high order corrections, presumably. So what you would like is to have a scheme which you can easily get from this, which has, which is close to lambda, where the lambda parameters are closer to one, more like order of one. And that can actually be achieved uh, in a very simple way. Uh, and this was pointed out in roughly the same days, the early eighties by Parisi originally, the mean field improved lattice action which is a lattice coupling. You take your one over this coupling, one over GL squared, and you just multiply it by the average value of the plaquette, rescaled by one over N, the trace of the plaquette. And that turns out when you do the, when you convert, when you put in the perturbative expression for this and convert the lambda parameters, you find out that it's about 2.6, the ratio, which is okay. I mean, that means that they're roughly just as good as each other in terms of high order corrections, the importance of high order corrections. So that's a kind of improved lattice coupling, which I will move, use once or twice later in these lectures. Uh, it's actually a, one of the many improved 
lattice couplings people have looked at, and it's quite a popular one, some variant on this, very similar variant on this, but, but the basic idea is, is to do this. There were some reasons for doing this, but uh, I won't go into that. Ah, what is the MS bar scheme? Well, uh, okay, that's, I'm not going to go into that really, but it's one of the standard schemes used by uh, people doing perturbation theory in phenomenology and so on. So it's a, it's a standard scheme which involves dimensional regularization and uh, minimal subtraction is the MS. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember all the details, which since I don't use it, <laughs> I'm not going to try to answer your question in detail, but it's, 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 it's what people use in, uh, in uh, perturbative calculations typically in phenomenology and so on. Uh, you know, when, when they uh, fit things that they get from data. Um, okay, so let's look uh, at what we can go, go now to what we can calculate and have a look at the kind of calculations we might do. So we have our lattice correlator, correlation function, which involves some operator at time zero and another operator at a, on another time slice in our lattice. And we're looking at the product of these and how that product varies as you change the time separation. Uh, so I wrote this as a, uh, so first of all, the time is discrete. It's a certain number of integer lattice facings. So that the e to the minus ht I had in my correlation function becomes e to the minus Hamiltonian times a lattice spacing times an integer. And really, I should say that it's what people call the transfer matrix is the thing that you can, uh, is the name for the, what takes you from one time slice to another, the time uh, transfer uh, from one lattice space, one slice of the lattice, time slice for the lattice to the next one. Uh, in writing it as e to the minus h, I'm making assumptions that basically the, this transfer matrix has the values lie in the interval zero to one, uh, which, uh, and that there's, you know, that is not, not got any complex eigenvalues, things like that, which it might have on a general lattice action. So, um, so uh, it so happens that the plaquette action I'm using uh, behaves exactly like, in those terms, behaves exactly like an exponential of a Hamiltonian. So that's good, and I will continue to write it in this form uh, for that reason. It has the same positivity properties, so, and uh, so I will continue to write it like that. Um, however, one has, of course, to realize that the Hamiltonian on the lattice is different from the continuum Hamiltonian, and it's precisely extrapolating it to the continuum is what we're doing when we look at its eigenvalues and extrapolate those to the continuum. Ah, I seem to have repeated myself here. I've repeated myself not because this is a crucial point, but just because uh, the copy and paste got stuck. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so anyway, so our Euclidean correlator, which is here now, instead of time, I will put in, sometimes I will use time, sometimes I will replace it by its explicit lattice value of lattice spacing times some integer. It becomes this, and it becomes this. And what you see now, the time has an A as well. And what you know is how many lattice spacings, the integer you know, because that's how many lattice spacings you've got between your operators. And what you will get when you fit the, this kind of function is you will get the energies times lattice spacing. So whatever you calculate will inevitably, and not surprisingly, it has to be that way, will be in units of the lattice spacing, or the energies and masses will be in the units of the lattice spacing. So, um, <clears throat> so, okay. Now, when we talk about locating a continuum limit, let me, so this is an aside now. I, uh, I want to stop for a moment. Uh, I talked about how you can locate the continuum limit of SUN gauge theories because you know asymptotic freedom tells you that the beta is at infinity for the continuum limit because it goes like one over G squared and G squared goes to zero in the continuum limit. So uh, what, what about more generally? So suppose you have a lattice theory 
with some coupling G, it, um, in general, many couplings, but I will just write one for, uh, for brevity. Uh, you can ask at what coupling might there be a continuum limit? So what you can do is you can calculate on the lattice using these correlation functions, you can calculate at each G, uh, the whole grid of G values, you can calculate uh, the mass gap. It will come out in lattice units, as we just saw from the correlation function. So what you will get is the value of the lattice spacing times the mass gap. And uh, if the lattice spacing is to go to zero, that means this has to go to zero. So you're looking for a coupling G star such that the mass gap goes to zero as G goes to G star. So that you can do in general, even if uh, G star is not zero in a theory where you don't have asymptotic freedom. And in that sense, this is a candidate for being a continuum limit. However, that's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition because, for example, you can also imagine it might be the case that there is a continuous symmetry that is recovered as G goes to G star. That's what's really happened. You're recovering a continuous symmetry. You have several couplings, and uh, uh, at, the, at some values of the G stars, you have the symmetry back again. But this symmetry may be spontaneously broken, which means you have Goldstone bosons. So actually, what may be happening is that the mass gap is going to zero, not the lattice spacing. But that is a rather special case, but you have to be wary of that. But in general, what you would start off for looking for is a coupling where the uh, mass gap in units of the lattice spacing is going to zero, uh, and um, which is equivalent to the lattice spacing in units of the mass gap going to, sorry, the mass, no, I, I said that wrong, the lattice spacing in units of the mass gap going to zero. That's what you're looking for initially. And then you just have to check that the nothing special is going on. And that is really a continuum limit. Yeah. Are here. Uh, well, uh, I think in okay. No, I mean, uh, are you saying that there might be several points at which this might happen? In in a general theory, there may be more than one possible continuum limit within var various couplings. So there may be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it depends. So, so once, you, once you look at details, once you're wondering whether it is a Goldstone boson or something else, you can also look at ratios of masses. You calculate a lot of masses and you look at their ratios, how they behave as you go. I mean, some continuum limits may be free fields theories. Others will not be. Well, so this is now not the SUN gauge theories because there we know where the continuum limit is, is that weight equals infinity. So here we're talking, I, I just wanted to generalize to uh, a more general field theory, which I'm not considering, going to consider at all in detail, uh, or at all actually, but just other field theories where you may be interested in finding a continuum, a continuum limit. So all I was saying is that to look for a continuum limit, what you can do if you know nothing about the theory analytically, so you can't, as for SU and gauge theories, we do know something analytically. We know from asymptotic freedom quite a lot, enough to tell us where to go. But if you don't know that, then uh, you can still do a, a kind of, you can do calculations at various values of the couplings. So there's a lot of calculations to do. And you, and you start finding where, uh, where is it that the um, uh, mass gap that you calculate, A times mg, is be becoming small. And you focus on that area and do more calculations and you find where it goes to zero. And that would be, and that would be at certain specific couplings, which you would be a candidate for being a continuum limit. That's how you would, uh, I think, go. And this sort of moves on. Ah. So uh, is there necessarily a conformal fixed point at each of these guys or uh, a conformal fixed point? Uh, well, uh, the next slide is sort of half addresses that. Um, Thing is that it's another aside. These are all asides at this point. Uh, if you consider the correlation length um, in the theory, it's the inverse of the mass gap. Now, if you consider the correlation length in the lattice units, you divide by lattice spacing, you get the inverse of the mass uh, A times the mass gap. Now, A times the mass, when A goes to zero, and A in units of this mass gap, 
this thing goes to infinity. So your correlation length goes to infinity in units of the lattice spacing as you approach a continuum limit, which is in the statistical mechanical language is a second order phase transition. So if you're doing some calculation in a, some lattice statistical mechanical system and you have a second order phase transition, then it's a possible continuum limit. You still have, of course, have to be careful, it may be free field, it may be whatever. There was this aside earlier about, but anyway, that's a possible, that is typically a continuum limit of some kind. So it's interesting if you like. Uh, I suppose so, yes, except of course the, the, I mean, for instance, with the second order phase transition in the case of, um, in the case of uh, the non-abelian theories is actually at beta equals infinity. So you can't just look at, you know, I was speaking G star as if it was a finite G, but it may be off at infinity. So you have to be a bit careful. So that's where the second, but otherwise I think that's, that's true. I mean, the, if, you, if the correlation length diverges, you expect a second order phase transition. And if there's no second order phase transition, if there's no place where the correlation length diverges, there's no continuum limit for that particular theory. I think that's, uh, unless there are some special cases which I'm not aware of. So these were aside, oh, another aside. Yes. Uh, so uh, in general, we're interested in uh, the coupling going to zero, that's beta becoming large, because that's getting close to the continuum limit. However, of course, there is another region where the beta becomes is small, and we want to avoid that region if what you're interested in is continuum physics, although you may be interested in it for other reasons. But I'll just, so I'll say a few words about that. Um, so if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at our path integral, and if beta becomes small, effectively, you no longer constrain uh, the integral over the gauge, gauge fields, because this becomes a very weak constraint. And so you have large fluctuations. And in addition, uh, you can expand this in powers of beta once the uh, beta is small, sufficiently small. So everything you calculate is a power expansion in powers of beta, which is like inverse powers of G squared. Um, so that's very different from what you have in a weak coupling case. You may get logarithms sometimes, depending on what you're calculating, logs of beta as well. Now, uh, one of the interest, I mean, this is another, I haven't written this down, but you can actually show very simply that you have linear confinement in the strong coupling limit of SU and gauge theories. Uh, it's a very simple calculation. Uh, and it's uh, uh, in itself, it's, it's not very useful, but it's very, uh, very interesting that that happens there. So uh, now suppose we go towards the continuum limit, make beta larger, then of course that's, this now suppresses fluctuations. And what we know is that the interesting physics to the extent we can expand, expand it in powers of, of beta is going to be in powers of one over beta because it's powers of G squared. So uh, this is very different functional form and you would expect some kind of crossover between these regions uh, at some finite beta. Uh, and this crossover, this type of crossover from strong to weak coupling uh, does occur. And if you're in four dimensions, there's a marked crossover uh, for SU2 and SU3 and SU4, I think. And from SU5 onwards, it becomes a first order phase transition. So uh, with the kind of plaquette action I'm using. And in D equals three dimensions, uh, this has been looked at, there is a crossover at all finite n, and it becomes a third, seems to become, this is all numerical, you can't do things analytically in this case, it becomes third order at n equals infinity, and if you look in detail the transition, it really looks very much like the two-dimensional Gross-Witten transition, going back again to the early eight. it looks very much like that in terms of the I pattern of eigenvalues and so on, Wilson Lux and so on, so it's um, uh, in two plus one dimensions, you're very similar to in this transition to the D equals two, uh, theory, but the D equals four is somewhat different. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not, uh, okay, so we're not going to, I'm not going to be looking, studying the crossover. It's more that you want to be beyond it. For the, if you are interested in doing continuum physics and well away from the strong coupling region, you want to be well away from the crossover and uh, to be uh, in this weak coupling region where, um, where the beta is large enough to, to, uh, for things to be power, you know, to be expanded in powers of G squared. Those things that can be expanded in perturbation theory. So it's true, I'm not studying the crossover itself. I'm just saying that's a 
that's a kind of de that delineates the region from the strong coupling and the weak coupling region. We're interested in being in the weak coupling region. But it has some interesting features because if you if you think about this into the strong coupling region, the fluctuations are large. And if the fluctuations are large, then what they're doing is they're exploring the whole group manifold. Well, once you get to uh, close to the continuum limit where the fluctuations are much smaller, they effectively, they're near a unity and they explore the Lie algebra. So if you compare two theories like SO3 and SU2, which have the same Lie algebra, at large beta, as you approach the continuum limit, you would expect them to have the same physics. But if you look at strong coupling, they're very different. They're very different fluctuations which are dominating the structure of things, including the you know, stream tensions. You can also calculate global masses in the strong coupling region and so on by correlation function and so on. So they're different. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting if you're, you may be interested in that. There's sort of topological objects there which are differ from the others. There is a further transition, which I won't talk about at all, but there is a, something called a roughening transition which certainly exists, is known to exist in three dimensions and almost certain, or probably in D equals four, but it's a, probably a crossover and it's, a, it's to do with, at, in a strong coupling region, things like strings would be completely rigid in the sense that it would cost you energy to make any deformation. While as you go to the weak coupling region, you can have long fluctuations, strings become rough. So there is a kind of, which is well known to certain, in certain condensed matter systems, uh, well-known transition, uh, and uh, it, hasn't, I, so I, I, uh, it has been studied to some extent, but again, it's something that you would study if you're really interested in the strong coupling region or that kind of statistical mechanics physics, rather than the continuum physics that we're primarily interested, primarily interested in. Well, uh, no, I mean, in this, well, both these transitions, I mean, you, the usual, you know, one likes to make the statement that we know that you have confinement in the extreme strong coupling region. And if there's no phase transition going to the continuum limit, then uh, sure, you have confinement in the continuum limit. However, what could be happening is that just as the continuum, uh, the second order phase transition con con corresponding to the continuum limit is at infinity, it could be that effectively there is also a transition there from, you know, that effectively what could happen is, for example, the string tension in physical units could be going to zero, even though there is no phase transition in between strong coupling and weak coupling. So I can't prove it doesn't go to zero. So I haven't proven confinement, unfortunately, for this uh, <laughs> collaboration meeting, <laughs> but uh, or fortunately, perhaps. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, so, but it is, it's a whole sort of hint because, uh, and it's, it's also nice to see how, how it works in strong coupling although I don't think it gives too much intuition about what might be happening in, in the real world. Yeah. You're thinking of, you're thinking of, well, okay, so are you thinking of a lattice theory? Because it's certainly true that the, that the location of the crossover of this uh, is very different, is different in SU2 and SO3. Very different beta, I mean, very different beta. You can use the same betas, you won't get a... Well, okay, so it depends what you mean by proper. Here I'm talking about SO3 matrices on the links of the lattice as my SO3 gauge theory, or SU2 uh, matrices on the links of the lattice as my SU2 gauge theory. That's my, uh, the theories I'm comparing here. Yes, 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. They make all the difference. Yeah. Okay, so, so that may well be the, the, indeed, but that means, so if you're interested in this, I've sort of made that comment here about, if you don't get, it's precisely these to, uh, kind of topological objects which, which, uh, which make the difference between SO3 and SU2 in, in this formulation. And if you do get rid of them, then, yeah, that's uh, quite possible. But, but I'm, uh, I'm trying to avoid the strong coupling region in this set of lectures rather than, <laughs> Uh, but I, I agree, it's interesting. That's why I mentioned this, because I think it's an interesting area to think about. Uh, exactly. It is an interesting statistical field theory. That's right. That's right. But uh, so, well, okay, Monte Carlo. Um, how much time do I have left? Okay, great. Great, yeah, yeah, thanks. So um, Monte Carlo, so now we are going to be trying to calculate things in our SUN lattice gauge theory or related, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, gauge, the, uh, gauge um, uh, theories where you, have a, uh, where you have a Lie group, gauge invariance corresponding to a Lie group. Uh, although I'm mainly interested in SUN, but I'll look at some others as well later on in the lectures. So Monte Carlo, well, um, here is our sort of thing we want to calculate, where the Z is, of course, the same as this, but without this thing in the integrand, the phi. So we're looking here at the expectation value of some operator, which may be a correlation function. It may be a product of two fields at different uh, times. Uh, so that's the sort of thing we want to evaluate. And what we will, what we will, and the way to evaluate the Monte Carlo is to produce some number, let's call it n, of lattice fields. So that this U is a when I, is a lattice field. It's the link matrices on the whole, all the links of the lattice. So, um, and we want to produce these fields with this weighting. If we produce these things, these fields with this weighting, then all we have to do is to calculate phi for each one of these fields and take its average. And uh, if they're independent, these fields from each other that we've generated, statistically independent, then um, the error on that, there will be a statistical error, which will be the order one over the square root of n. It's of course important to do this because this is a huge, uh, this is an integral with many integrations. And if I just pick fields at random, then even with an astronomical number of fields, the error here would be astronomically large. So it's important to pick the fields in the region where, they're, where uh, they have a large weight, according to the measure and the uh, well, uh, primarily this factor here, this kind of Boltzmann factor. Now that is not so difficult to do in this case because um, you can actually just look at one, one link at a time and you can talk about changing that. And you want, what you want to do is to change it with some probability distribution. You want to take a, a link matrix, a matrix on a link L and, and uh, replace it potentially with another matrix on that same link with a probability distribution of this form, which satisfies uh, this relation. That is to say, if I have an ensemble of fields uh, which have uh, uh, which have that, uh, if I apply this to an ensemble of fields, uh, then I should get, the new ensemble I get should be precisely the same. I may have exchanged one matrix for another, but then in another member of this ensemble, that, that would have been exchanged back to the other one and so on. So you end up with the same ensemble here and here. That's what you want. Uh, and that's actually um, not too hard to do in our case because our, our action is very local. That is to say, if you look at our action, if you look at where, what, wh where it involves a given matrix on a link L, it only involves it on six plaquettes. That is to say you have a link and you have a plaquette here that involves it, another plaquette, 
another here, another here, and that will be in three dimensions. In four dimensions, there's two more. So there are six plaquettes. There are six plaquettes on which the link L lies and which involve it. And all you have to do is to make sure that you satisfy this kind of relation for just this piece of the action, because the rest of the action doesn't involve the link matrix, that link, and therefore doesn't care what you have put on that link. And there are various algorithms that will uh, do that. It's, uh, it's clearly a finite problem. Um, there's some called Metropolis. The simplest is Metropolis. It's not always the most, it's not the most efficient, but it's the simplest. Heat bath, over relaxation, various algorithms. Um, so uh, I will not go through the algorithm, partly because that would take too much, take time. Uh, and if you want to see the algorithm, actually a good place to look, but well, there are various reviews and so on. But if you get hold of this very old book by Kreutz from about 1985, that is uh, something called like Blue Ones Lattice, something, something like that. But it's Cambridge University Press, thin book, because it was in the early days of lattice field theory, there wasn't too much to say. So you had a thin book, which is great. You don't, you don't need a good index. Um, it's all in the chapters. And it goes through and it, it, it tells you in detail how the metropolis works and also how the heat bath works. So I would recommend that, although you can find many other reviews, uh, lecture notes and so on, on the archive. So, um, yeah. Mm, yeah. So what you are constraining here is the probability distribution of the value of one time. Yeah. Well, it's constrained in the sense that ultimately, if I apply, if I have a whole, uh, an infinite set of fields, which are distributed with the correct distribution, of an infinite set of fields, and I apply that process, probably with that, prob that, that algorithm I've got here, which is probabilistic, it's a probabilistic algorithm, so there's some random numbers or whatever going on inside it. If I apply that to this infinite set of fields, I will get another infinite set of fields, which is now different. And, uh, and my, uh, but what I want is that the distribution of that new infinite, infinite set of fields should be the same as the original one. I may have changed one field to another field, but the ultimate distribution is the same. That means that, uh, that, that, means that I will be a, well, okay. That's, uh, it's effectively saying that what I'm doing, that, the, that, that this, um, this, 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 uh, distribution is a fixed point of this kind of algorithm. I, I keep applying it, applying it, applying it, it's just a fixed point of that algorithm. And it, it, as I say, it's, it's easy to, relatively easy to do here be, just because the action is so local. Okay. Um, no, I'm not gonna sketch it. So. Let's talk very briefly, I'm, I'm going to be talking about gauge fields, but I should say something about other fields. If you have a scalar field, what would you do? Well, suppose you have a scalar field in the fundamental representation, you would just assign it naturally to the, each side of the lattice. You would, you know, afterwards, phi of x, why not just put it a phi, the phi, that field on each side of the lattice? Uh, and then you would couple it to the gauge fields, uh, building up on a term like this, which is gauge invariant. You know, if this is in the fundamental representation, it will give you a g of n, you'll get a G, uh, G dagger of N, and then you'll get a G of N from this if you do a gauge transformation, which will cancel that, and the same here, so you get a gauge invariant action for the, um, and you can put mass terms and so on as well for the, for the, uh, uh, for the scalar field. So that's straightforward, and you could update it with the metropolis as well, if you like. Uh, the other interesting case, really interesting case, is a fermion, and that already creates a certain unease because, okay, you have uh, scalars are naturally put on the sides of the lattice. Uh, vectors, gauge potentials are naturally put on the links. They have some direction. If I had, if I wanted to put in a tensor field, I might be thinking of putting it on plaquettes, which have two directions, two indices. A plaquette is defined by two indices, the two directions. So that's what I might do. But what do you do with a fermion? It's sort of in between. Well, uh, geometrically speaking, there's nothing obvious that you can, imme nothing immediately obvious you can do. So what one does is just put it on the sides like a scalar field. But that raises another issue. Uh, and that is that, um, suppose I put one field like that, one fermionic field on the lattice like that. It will, has a, it will have, and I, get, I can make it by uh, using the gauge potential, I can give it a gauge invariant action. Um, uh, but the trouble is, 
that uh, and and indeed it will have a u1 uh, it was in, it will be invariant as psi dagger times d slash psi with a d slash involving not gauge potentials but some some matrices uls uh, the pro and that will have an explicit uh, u1 uh, phase factor invariance so a flavor u1 because there's just one fermion and uh, however it's all well defined it's on a finite lattice i can take the continuum limit everything looks very well defined and that makes you very uneasy because you expect to see an anomaly in this axial symmetry so and it doesn't seem to have and, and in the old language we were told in the previous lecture we shouldn't really pay too much you know which is not the uh, ideal language to say to be talking about what happens in the ultraviolet and so on and so on this the lattice looks like a regularization in which you can preserve the axial U1 symmetry without an anomaly. So that's very worrying. And so it turns out, if you look very much closer, that what you thought was actually one fermion is actually 16 fermions. Um, that's to say, it turns out when you look at the action that you have to put in on the lattice because of hermeticity for the, uh, um, at least the spatial components of that action, if you look at the uh, energy momentum relation of these fermions, not only do you have, uh, say, and you're using massless fermions, so there's no mass term, not only does the energy go to zero when the momentum is zero, it also goes to zero at all, uh, whenever the uh, momentum becomes uh, ultra, um, the maximum ultraviolet momentum, whenever any component becomes the ultraviolet maximum component, and there's 16 of those, it's the edges of the Brillouin zone. So the, um, they actually have 16 flavors here, and when you look at even more carefully, they have different uh, charges under, the axial on symmetry, axial you on symmetry, and the anomaly cancels for that reason. So that's fine in the end. But it's not fine in the sense that you've got 16 fermions. You don't really want 16 fermions normally in your, in your calculations. So uh, you can reduce that to four. Kobe Suskin did that with staggered fermions, but you still have four. And then if you're very brave, you get determinants out of integrating the fermions, and uh, you can take the fourth root of that, but some people are less happy with that kind of process than others. But anyway, you can do that. An alternative, that you can do is Wilson's fermions, where you actually add an explicit irrelevant chiral symmetry breaking like this to the action. And then you have to, because that induces, uh, induces an extra uh, mass renormalization that's additive, uh, it, it, uh, you have to tune masses in the calculation, so it's a bit more complicated. But never, nonetheless, these are the things that are mainly used these days on QCD calculations. Uh, because uh, they're quite fast, relatively fast. Nonetheless, if you wanted a really good fermion, we now know how to do really good fermions on the lattice, which we didn't know for a long time, but by the time you get to mid 90s, late 90s, uh, it became apparent that there were two sort of fermions, which are actually in some sense can be shown to be equivalent to each other. One is the uh, kaplan shamir domain wall fermions, where you go to five dimensions and your four dimensions are on slices in the five dimensions. And you can get chiral, uh, you, know, you can deal with fermions that way and have good chiral symmetry and so on properties. And the other one is straightforward in Neuberger, Narayan, Narayan uh, type of fermions, overlap fermions, which uh, have very good properties. They're in four dimensions, They're a bit non local, the action. So it's a bit harder, to, much more expensive to calculate with, but it has all the good properties. If you put in topological charge, they give exact zero modes, not just. With these, you would get approximate zero modes, but here you get exact zero modes, which is very nice. So that is all very nice. And then you have, uh, okay, so one final word about fermions, because I'm going to leave this to, Fiala will uh, deal with fermions um, in much, in proper, in much uh, greater uh, detail in this little sketch here. Uh, if you look at the action, so if you're putting in fermions, you would have this part of the action, which is our pure gauge action. Then inside, as part of the integrand, you've got the integral over the fermionic fields with uh, some uh, uh, gauge invariant action here, psi bar psi over this here. Now, these are fermionic, so uh, they're Grassmann variables and uh, our computer doesn't like Grassmann variables. So we, get we integrate them explicitly, which you can do, of course, because this is quadratic and it's quadratic, so you get a determinant. But this, this is now a, uh, a rather complex functional determinant like this, you can raise it up into the action and then it becomes a, and now you've got an effective action. You're doing a pure gauge calculation, but with an effective action that is your original nice local Wilson action or whatever you are using, 
and but in addition this piece here so you can't use the kind of algorithms that i've been describing uh, metrop metropolis or at least they would take forever to work and there have been uh, other algorithms that have been developed and this is very non-local so it's much slower and much more uh, and but that's what you need for qcd and you need small small masses here for qcd which means this is very non-local unfortunately uh, what you've got is loops in the vacuum which are large uh, if you're lucky they're determined by the pion mass really by the pion compton wavelength rather than the inverse of the quark mass which is a much uh, larger object so i can't re I, I want to show you because a lot of the um, original um, motivation for doing lattice was to look at qcd and get the qcd spectrum and so i'd just like to show you a plot of the sort of spectrum you get these these days ah oh, sorry Uh, no, the, the, the sign, uh, the, uh, no, that's right, it's it, 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 to do with the phase. They still have the same, same issues with the sign problem. So yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah the sign problem is, is a problem that hasn't been entirely resolved. People have had various strategies for approaching it. This is to do with dealing with phases. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the main uh, interest in that has been, um, with finite chemical potential, uh, but also uh, with uh, finite theta, the topological theta term. Uh, and of course, ultimately you would like to do Minkowski space time, but uh, if, you, if you can do the sign problem, you can probably handle that. So here's a, I pulled off, this may not be the best, uh, but this is one of the new generation of calculations uh, very careful ones where the quark masses have been tuned down to physical values so that your pi mass is at 135 or whatever it is MeV. Uh, and uh, so really small quark masses which, that required new algorithms, not, not, not just new, uh, more powerful computers, but also you have to use the most powerful computers. So these are sort of relatively large collaborations doing these kind of calculations. And uh, so here is one of the current spectrum spectra for QCD uh, and you need quite a large volume so that the, which is much bigger than the pi and Compton wavelength. So you don't feel a finite volume effects. So, uh, okay, so here is uh, uh, one, one such example of such spectrum. I think it's one of the best ones that region. I don't know, uh, uh, there must be others as well. And what you see here compared, uh, first of all, you need to put in some, you need to use some of these states to set scales for yourself. You need to set the scale of the, quark up and down quark masses you need to set the scale of the strange quark masses here we're ignoring as far as i know the charm quark mass which plays not much of a role and then you need to set the overall scale to get mev units so, because this thing here says mev so uh, so uh, you need that so you need three part to fix three of the masses to do that and, th and that is here it's been the pion the k meson and the, the psi baryon have been used for that purpose these for the quark masses and this for the scale and uh, so the fact that these points, the in, these are input points, they're not results of the calculation. So you shouldn't think that of as perfect success. That's also the input. The actual results of the calculation are the red points. And the experimental values are the horizontal lines. These are the uh, me, this is the value you'll get from the uh, tables for the masses. And then there is this kind of a shaded area, which is the width of those particles, like the rho meson has a finite width as, as has the K star. So you see here um, that it's pretty good. At the, you know, the, we, we can say, we can now say that lattice field theory can calculate the QCD spectrum and it comes out as you expected, which is good news of course for QCD, <laughs> which is fine, uh, no shocks there. Uh, and it's also, uh, so that's, that's very good. Uh, and people have moved on, they're doing all kinds of things, G minus two, uh, you know, contributions of, uh, of uh, uh, isospin, break, isospin breaking to, to uh, the different pions and so on. So there's a lot going on, which is uh, so high order effects. It's interesting to ask, you know, back in the nineties, people were still doing what we call a valence quark approximation. So you were doing, you were, you were just, you, what you were doing is producing gauge fields without any fermions, and then you were calculating quark propagators in those gauge fields. 
and you're calculating the masses of the hadrons from that. So it's, uh, it's, it's like a valence quark approximation in the sense that, you know, for a meson, you have a quark and an anti-quark, and for a baryon, you have three quarks. It's slightly better because they're relativistic. Your propagators can go backwards. So if you cut them somewhere, you will get a few C pairs, which is, uh, not, which is a bit better than the traditional valence quark approximations and potential models. So if I show you um, that's from 10 years before that, roughly, um, here, is a, here is, for example, uh, if you look at just the solid points, ignore the open points. Again, here you use the k-meson and the pi to fix uh, the strange quark, and the, uh, the pi isn't shown because that was used as an input. And then what you see is that uh, actually uh, you are actually, the points, they're not too far from the measured values, the experimental values, but they are significantly not there. So, you know, at the sort of, uh, at the 5% or 10% level, the valence quark approximation doesn't work too badly, it's got the right trends, but it's not uh, really, what you've ignored here, or the, what you haven't got in this calculation are the effects of quark loops in the vacuum, because that was too expensive to do at the time, uh, but partly because we didn't, hadn't yet developed the algorithms that could deal with light quarks. It turned out that when you tried to make the quarks very light, you hit a kind of brick wall, the computation time just exploded exponentially. Uh, and it turned out that this was really a multi-scale problem and you had to have algorithms which dealt with multi-scale problems. Uh, and once that was done, we, one could proceed further on, on, of course, teraflop and petaflop computers, uh, which is not what you need for gauge theories. And I'll stop there and go back to gauge theories now, uh, but I'm running out of time. Uh, the gauge theory calculations I'm talking about can be done on, partly you can do it on desktops or a few uh, small cluster. So um, tomorrow I'll cap, continue with an introduction now focusing more on the physics you can extract on a lattice. And in my third lecture, I will talk about some things you learn about confinement, although there will also be a bit of that in the second lecture as well. There'll be an overlap. So, okay. Let me put it back to the right one. I, I, well, I, I think people were confident they were using, I think those were using Wilson fermions. Um, so I think that was okay. Uh, this was, I think what I saw showed there was the calculations by collaboration, which is led by someone called Zoltan Foldor, uh, and Bielefeld Hungarian and uh, Wuppertal and so on collaboration. So I think that was a perfectly good, but it is very, yeah, yeah. I think it was a good calculation. Sorry? On depend on what, sorry. Oh, well, uh, if, you, if you don't, um, if, if, you, if you make the quark mass, for example, if you take the extreme, you take the quark mass is heavy. And that's of course what people initially did because that's much faster and much easier to do. So people have spectra for different quark masses. And, uh, uh, and uh, those have been done uh, years earlier, but basically at, when the quark mass becomes large, um, so I, ca I can't offhand, uh, I don't have anything to show you, but the spectrum does change. You know, obviously uh, the, uh, the pine becomes more massive. Um, uh, the rho meson doesn't become so much more massive because you're making the renormalization group invariant masses larger, but there is also the effective constituent quark mass is quite large anyway, and that's changing just a bit. And so the row gets a bit more heavy. Uh, obviously, if you make the quark mass much heavier, then everything gets heavier, the baryons, everything else. But I'm not sure if, if the sort of things that you might be interested in, or what are the, any kind of symmetries in the spectrum, I'm not sure if I can answer that question offhand. I, mean, I, I can't remember. Yeah. 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 The, uh, so here, the thing that is not perfect here is that we've taken the up and down quark masses equal. And they're, of course, not really equal uh, in, in reality. Nowadays, people have calculated on the lattice the up and down normalization group very accurately. So you've got the strange quark mass, the down quark mass, the up quark mass. They've all been 
uh, there are predictions for these masses. So they're, they're, that's nice. I mean, it's. Um, Yes, I guess that's right. You would need more inputs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's part of the splitting of the pi plus and pi zero. And so, so things, uh, so it's a, uh, yeah. So that's an extra level of sophistication, which since this was sort of uh, 12 years ago, so, well, 15 years ago, almost, uh, we, uh, the people have followed up on that in the last few years, but I don't have any more. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, it's quite impressive, yeah. There's a lot of good work in QCD. It's amazing. There's a lot of, I mean, <laughs> I mean, most of the, you know, most of the lattice field theory, uh, I would say most of the work has been these collaborations doing QCD or things related to QCD more phenomenologically uh, inclined. So that's, uh, you know, there's a whole world out there. But it doesn't directly have too much to do with confinement because you might get much the same spectrum, even if the theory was not asymptotically confining. All you need is the potential that you've got. We're talking of potentials up to a certain point, and then you know all the quarks are within a certain distance of each other. They don't know about the about what goes on out there at very large distances. So confinement is. Uh, well, that was there was a lot of work in the 70s on that before people could do numerical work. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, and some of the people, main people working in that, as soon as they could, they went moved on to the numerical work because they didn't feel it was very successful, I think. So I don't think it was, it was, you know, it was interesting, but it was not, you can't really use, I don't think you can use strong coupling expansion. You won't get, uh, yeah, you don't know. I really can't tell you. I mean, I haven't looked at that for a very long time, so I can't tell you. But I think it would be completely different. Uh, yeah. I think it was the idea that somehow you have to do the kind of updates you do, which is do with different algorithms. You have to do them separately. You have to have a separate set of updates for things which are on the larger scales, distance scales, and then separately for lower scales, and then sort of interrelate them. I mean, I think I haven't done that in detail, so I can't really tell you confidently what it, if there's some, what it, but it was something to do with the fact that you were realizing that this is a multi scale problem once the quark mass becomes light. You know, you've got the glue balls, and the glue balls are one scale, the gluonic degrees of freedom, the glue balls. Uh, they are about, uh, as we'll see, their, their mass is in the, the lightest glue balls around 1.5 GV. And then you've got the pions, which are a factor of 10 smaller than that in mass, and the quark masses, which are far smaller. So they're re it's a really a multi scale problem. And I think once that was realized and the algorithms were tuned for that, that made all the difference. But uh, maybe Fiala will have more to say on that, that, issue, that question when she talks about fermions in her lectures. Well, everything is... Uh, uh, everything remains gauge invariant because the action doesn't change. So even if I change the link variable and I do a gauge transformation, my plaquette doesn't change. Ah, the, uh, ah. well, when I, when I update, when I change the matrices using this algorithm, I am actually changing the field configuration. So it will have different if you like different physics, that particular configuration would give, would, would give different values for the average plaquette, for the plaquette. Uh, it would give different values for everything. And that's what you want, because you, what you're trying to do is to sample this, inter we are integrating over all possible field configurations constrained by this kind of Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta s. And what we want is to pick configurations that are independent of each other, which means they really carry different, a bit of different physics. It's maybe wrong to call of it, uh, given a single configuration doesn't really carry physics in some sense, but you know, 
has different provides different contributions to the physics. <laughs> no, you don't have to fix gauge on here. We don't have to fix gauge at all, unlike perturbative calculation, because all the fields are comp compact. The uh, you know they're all SUN. Uh, whereas if you're dealing in perturbation theory, you have a, your gauge potential goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big difference in that sense. So, uh, so you don't have to fix the probability when you do this kind of, when you update a f one field to the next field, the probability that um, the next field is just a gauge transformation of the original field is, is essentially zero. It's a sort of measure zero thing. So uh, of course, if I went on to infinity, I don't know, it depends what kind of infinity. It makes things more efficient by, by removing Well, it's a zero possibility, as you zero. say, it's zero. So you don't know, you don't need to uh, remove it. No. It doesn't happen. You will, you will never, in no person's, unless they've made an error in their code, never has, <laughs> <laughs> has the application of this algorithm led to a gauge transformation of the thing one you started with. 